Disc 29, Night Watch By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 14x22 The advance, therefore, was by means of a slowly alongly elongating huddle. Rust didn't notice. He had a gift for not seeing things he did not want to see and not hearing things he did not want to hear. And what he saw was a barricade. Ankh-Morpork these days wasn't really a city, not when the chips were down. Places like Dolly Sisters and Knapp Hill and Seven Sleepers had been villages once, be Night Watch 253 4 they were absorbed by the urban sprawl. On some level, they still held themselves separate. As for the rest, well, once you got off the main streets it was all down to neighborhoods. People didn't move around much. When tension was high, you relied on your mates and your family. Whatever was going down, you tried to make sure wasn't going down your street. It wasn't revolution. It was quite the reverse. It was defending your doorstep. They were building a barricade in Whalebone Lane. It wasn't a particularly good one, made up mostly of overturned market stalls, a small cart, and quite a lot of household furniture, but it was a symbol. Rust's mustache bristled. Right in our faces, he snapped. Absolutely, ants of constituted authority, sergeant. Do your duty. And what would that be at this point? Sir, said Vims. Arrest the ringleaders. And your men will pull the barricade down. Vims sighed. Very well, sir. If you will stand back. He walked up to the domestic clutter, aware of eyes watching him before and behind. When he was a few feet away, he cupped his hands. All right, all right, what's going on here, he shouted. He was aware of whispering. And he was ready for what happened next. When the stone, ew over the top of the furniture he caught it in both hands. I asked a civil question, he said. Come on. There was more whispering. He distinctly heard that's the sergeant from last night and some sort of sato voce argument. Then a voice shouted, death to the fascist oppressors. 254 T. Air Y. P. Ratchet. This time the argument was more frantic. He heard someone say, Oh, all right, and then, death to the fascist oppressors, present company accepted. There, is everyone happy now? He knew that voice. Mr. Reginald Chu, is it? He said. I regret that I have only one life to lay down for Whalebone Lane. The voice shouted from somewhere behind a wardrobe. If only you knew, Vim's thought. I don't think that will be necessary, he said. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Is this any way to behave? You can't take the law into your own hands. His voice faltered. Sometimes it takes the brain a little while to catch up with the mouth. Vims turned and looked at the squad, who'd needed no prompting at all to hang back. And then he turned to look at the barricade. Where, exactly, was the law? Right now? What did he think he was doing? The job, of course. The one that's in front of you. He'd always done it. And the law had always been. Out there, but somewhere close. He'd always been pretty sure where it was, and it day, nightly had something to do with the badge. The badge was important. Yes. It was shield-shaped. For protection. He'd thought about that, in the long nights in the darkness. It protected him from the beast, because the beast was waiting in the darkness of his head. He'd killed werewolves with his bare hands. He'd been mad with terror at the time, but the beast had been there inside, giving him strength. Night Watch 255 Who knew what evil lurked in the hearts of men? A copper, that's who. After ten years, you thought you'd seen it all, 
but the shadows always dished up more. You saw how close men lived to the beast. You found that people like Carcer were not mad. They were incredibly sane. They were simply men without a shield. They'd looked at the world and realized that all the rules didn't have to apply to them, not if they didn't want them to. They weren't fooled by all the little stories. They shook hands with the beast. But he, Sam Vims, had stuck by the batch, except for that time when even that hadn't been enough and he'd stuck by the bottle instead. He felt as if he'd stuck by the bottle now. The world was spinning. Where was the law? There was the barricade. Who was it protecting from what? The city was run by a madman and his shadowy chums, so where was the law? Coppers liked to say that people shouldn't take the law into their own hands, and they thought they knew what they meant. But they were thinking about peaceful times, and men who went around to sort out a neighbor with a club because his dog had crapped once too often on their doorstep. But at times like these, who did the law belong to? If it shouldn't be in the hands of the people, where the hell should it be? People who knew better? Then you got Winder and his pals, and how good was that? What was supposed to happen next? Oh yes, he had a badge, but it wasn't his, not really. And he'd got orders, and they were the wrong ones. And he'd got enemies, for all the wrong reasons. And maybe there was no future. It didn't exist anymore. There was nothing real, no solid point on which to stand, just Sam Vim's where he had no right to be. 256 T Air YP Ratchet It was as if his body, trying to devote as many resources as possible to untangling the spinning thoughts, was drawing those resources from the rest of Vim's. His vision darkened. His knees felt weak. There was nothing but bewildered despair. And a lot of explosions. Havelock Veterinary knocked politely on the window of the little of, CE just inside the Assassin's Guild main gate. The duty porter raised the hatch. Signing out, Mr. Maroon, said the Assassin. Yes sir, said Maroon, pushing a big ledger toward him. And where are we off to today, sir? General reconnoitering, Mr. Maroon. Just generally looking around. Ah, I said to MRS. Maroon, sir, that you are a great one for looking around, said Maroon. We look and learn, Mr. Maroon, we look and learn, said Veterinary, signing his name in the book and putting the pen back in its holder. And how is your little boy? Thank you for asking, sir, he's a lot better, said the porter. Glad to hear it. Oh, I see the hon. John Bleedwell is out on a commission. To the palace. Now, now, sir, said Maroon, grinning and waving a, enger. You know I couldn't tell you that, sir, even if I knew. Of course not. Veterinary glanced at the back wall of the of, see where, in an old brass rack, was a number of envelopes. The word active was inscribed at the top of the rack. Good afternoon, Mr. Maroon. Afternoon, sir. Good, er, looking. Night watch 257 he watched the young man walk out into the street. Then Maroon went into the cubby hole next to the of, CE to put the kettle on. He rather liked young veterinary, who was quiet and studious and, it had to be said, a generous young man on appropriate occasions. But a bit weird, all the same. Once Maroon had watched him in the foyer, standing still. That was all he was doing. He wasn't making any attempt at concealing himself. After half an hour, Maroon had wandered over and said, Can I help you, sir? And Veterinary had said, Thank you, no, Mr. Maroon. I'm just learning to stand still. To which there wasn't really any sensible comment that could be made. 
and the young man must have left after a while, because Maroon didn't remember seeing him again that day. He heard a creak from the of, see, and poked his head around the door. There was no one there. As he made the tea, he thought he heard a rustle from the of, see, and went to check. It was completely empty. Remarkably so, he thought later on. It was almost as if it was even more empty than it would be if there was just, well, no one in it. He went back to his comfy armchair in the cubbyhole, and relaxed. In the brass rack, the envelope marked bleed well, Jay slid back slightly. There were a lot of explosions. They, re-rackers bounced all over the street. Tambourines thudded, a horn blared a chord unknown in nature and a line of monks danced and danced and twirled around the corner, all chanting at the tops of their voices. Vims, sagging to his knees, was aware of dozens of 258 TRYP ratchet sandaled feet gyrating past, and grubby robes, ying. Rust was yelling something at the dancers who grinned and waved their hands in the air. Something square and silvery landed in the dirt. And the monks were gone dancing into an alleyway, yelling and spinning and banging their gongs. Wretched heathens, said Rust, striding forward. Have you been hit, Sergeant? Vims reached down and picked up the silver rectangle. A stone clanged off Rust's breastplate. As he raised his megaphone, a cabbage hit him on the knee. Vims stared at the thing in his hand. It was a cigar case slim and slightly curved. He fumbled it open and read. To Sam with love from your Sybil. The world moved. Vim still felt like a drifting ship. But at the end of the tether there was now the tug of the anchor, pulling the ship around so that it faced the current. A barrage of missiles was coming over the barricade. Throwing things was an old Ankh-Morpork custom and there was something about Rust that made him a natural target. With what dignity he could muster, he raised the megaphone again and got as far as I hereby warn you before a stone spun it out of his hand. Very well, then, he said and marched stiff, why back to the squad? Sergeant Keel, order the men to, re. One round of arrows, over the top of the barricade. No, said Vims standing up. I can only assume you've been stunned, Sergeant, said Rust. Men, prepare to execute that order. First man that, Ress, I will personally cut that man down, said Vims. He didn't shout. It was a simple, Night Watch 259 con, dense statement of precisely what the future would hold. Rust's expression did not change. He looked Vims up and down. Is this mutiny, then, Sergeant, said the captain. No. I'm not a soldier, sir. I can't mutiny. Martial law, Sergeant, snapped Rust. It is of, Chael. Really, said Vims, as another rain of rocks and old vegetables came down. Shields up, lads. Rust turned to Fred Colon. Corporal, you will put this man under arrest. Colon swallowed. Me. You, Corporal. Now. Colon's pink face mottled with white as the blood drained from it. But he he began. You won't? Then it seems I must, said the captain. He drew his sword. At that Vims heard the click of a crossbow safety catch going off, and groaned. He didn't remember this happening. You just put that sword away, sir, please, said the voice of Lance Constable Vims. You will not shoot me, you young idiot. That would be murder, said the captain calmly. Not where I'm aiming, sir. Bloody hell, thought Vims. Maybe the lad was simple. Because one thing Rust wasn't, was a coward. He thought idiot stubbornness was bravery. 
he wouldn't back down in the face of a dozen armed men. Ah, I think I can see the problem, Captain, Vim said brightly. As you were, Lance Constable. There's 260 T Air YP Ratchet been a slight misunderstanding, sir, but this should sort it out it was a blow he'd remember for a long time. It was sweet. It was textbook. Rust went down like a log. By the light of all his burning bridges, Vim slipped his hand back into his hip pocket. Thank you, MRS. Good body, and your range of little equalizers. He turned to the watchmen, who were a tableau of silent horror. Let the record show Sergeant at Arms John Keel did that, he said. Vims, what did I tell you about waving weapons around when you're not going to use them? You laid him out, Sarge. Sam squeaked, still staring at the sleeping captain. Vims shook some life back into his hand. Let the record show that I took command after the captain's sudden attack of obvious insanity, he said. Waddy, Wiglet. Drag him back to the house and lock him up, will you? What we gonna do, Sarge, wailed Colin. Ah. Uh, keep the peace. That was the thing. People often failed to understand what that meant. You'd go to some life-threatening disturbance like a couple of neighbors scrapping in the street over who owned the hedge between their properties, and they'd both be bursting with aggrieved self-righteousness, both yelling, their wives would either be having a private scrap on the side or would have adjourned to a kitchen for a shared pot of tea and a chat, and they all expected you to sort it out. And they could never understand that it wasn't your job. Sorting it out was a job for a good surveyor and a couple of lawyers, maybe. Your job was to quell the impulse to bang their stupid fat heads together, to ignore Night Watch 261 the affronted speeches of dodgy self-justy, Cation, to get them to stop shouting, and to get them off the street. Once that had been achieved, your job was over. You weren't some walking god, dispensing, Nelly-tuned natural justice. Your job was simply to bring back peace. Of course, if your few strict words didn't work, an M.R. Smith subsequently clambered over the disputed fence and stabbed M.R. Jones to death with a pair of gardening shears, then you had a different job, sorting out the notorious hedge argument murder. But at least it was one you were trained to do. People expected all kinds of things from coppers, but there was one thing that sooner or later they all wanted. Make this not be happening. Make this not be happening. What, he said, suddenly noticing a voice that had, in fact, been on the edge of awareness for some time. I said, was he insane, Sarge? But when you're falling off the cliff, it's too late to wonder if there might have been a better way up the mountain. He asked you to shoot at people who weren't shooting back, growled Vims striding forward. That makes him insane, wouldn't you say? They are throwing stones, Sarge, said Colin. So? Stay out of range. They'll get tired before we do. In fact, the barrage of missiles from the barricade had ceased, even in a time of crisis, the people of Ankh-Morpork would stop for a decent piece of street theater. Vims walked back toward them stopping on the way to retrieve Rust's bent megaphone. As he approached, he cast his eye over faces just visible through the chair legs and junk. There would be un 262 t air YP ratchet mentionables somewhere, he knew, helping matters along. With luck, they wouldn't have bothered with Whalebone Lane. There was muttering from the defenders. Most of them had a look Vims recognized, because it was the one he was trying to keep off his own face. It was the look of people whose world had suddenly been swept from under them, and now they were trying to tap dance on quicksand. He tossed away the stupid pompous megaphone. He cupped his hands. Some of you know me, he shouted. I'm Sergeant Keel, 
currently in command of the Treacle Mine Road Watch House. And I order you to dismantle this barricade there was a chorus of jeers and one or two badly thrown missiles. Vims waited, stock still, until they'd died away. Then he raised his hands again. I repeat, I order you to dismantle this barricade. He took a breath, and went on. And rebuilt it on the other side, oh the corner with Cable Street. And put up another one at the top of Shear Street. Properly built. Good grief, you don't just pile stuff up, for God's sake. A barricade is something you construct. Who's in charge here? There were sounds of consternation behind the overturned furniture, but a voice called out. You. There was nervous laughter. Very funny. Now laugh this one off. No one's interested in us yet. This is a quiet part of town. But when things really go bad, you're going to have cavalry on your backs. With sabers. How long would you last? If you shut off this end of treacle mine and the end of shear, then they're left with alleyways, and they don't like that. It's up to you, of course. We'd like to protect Night Watch 263U, but me and my men will be behind the barricades over here. He turned on his heel and marched back to the waiting watchman. Right, lads, he said. You heard. Pounce and Gaskin. You take the hurry-up wagon up to the bridge and turn it over. Wadi and Nancy Ball and you, too, Fred. Go and nick some carts. You grew up round here, so don't tell me you've never done that before. I want a couple blocking the streets down here, and the rest, I want you to run them into the alley mouths until they wedge. You men know the area. Block up all little back ways. Colin rubbed his nose. We could do that on the river side, Sarge, but it's all alleys on the Shades side. Can't block em all. I wouldn't worry about those, said Vims. Cavalry can't come through there. You know what they call a horse in the Shades. Colin grinned. Yeah, Sarge. Lunch. Right. The rest of you. Get all the benches and tables out of the watch house it dawned on him that none of the men had moved. There was a certain problem in the air. Well. Billy Wiglet removed his helmet and wiped his forehead. E.R. How far is this going to go, Sarge? All the way, Billy. But we took the oath, Sarge, and now we're disobeying orders and helping rebels. Doesn't seem right. Sarge, said Wiglet wretchedly. You took an oath to uphold the law and defend the citizens without fear or favor, said Vims. And to protect the innocent. That's all they put in. Maybe they 264 T Air YP Ratchet thought those were the important things. Nothing in there about orders, even from me. You're an of, sir of the law, not a soldier of the government. One or two of the men looked longingly at the other end of the street, empty and inviting. But I won't stop anyone who wants to walk, said Vims. They stopped looking. Hello, Mr. Keel, said a sticky voice behind him. Yes, Nobby, he said without turning around. Air, how did you detect it was me, Sergeant? It's an amazing talent, kid said Vims, turning, against all wisdom, to look at the urchin. What's been happening? Big riot in Sater Square, Sarge. And they say people ve broke into the Dolly sisters' watch house and thrown the lieutenant out the window. And there's lootin' all over the place, they say, and the day watch are out chassin' people, only most of em are hidin' now cause yet, I get the picture, sighed Vims. Carcer had been right. Coppers were always outnumbered, so being a copper only worked when people let it work. If they refocused and realized you were just another standard idiot with a penny worth of metal for a batch, you could end up as a smear on the pavement. 
he could hear shouting now, a long way off. He looked around at the hesitant watchman. On the other hand, gentlemen, he said, if you are going to leave, where are you going to go to? The same thought had clearly occurred to Colin and the others. We'll get the carts, he said, hurrying off. And I wants a penny, said Nobby, holding out a grubby hand. To the boy's amazement, Vims gave him night watch two hundred and sixty-five a dollar, saying, and just keep telling me everything, will you? Tables and benches were already being dragged out of the watch house, and after only a couple of minutes, Wadi arrived with a cartload of empty barrels. Barricades were easy in these streets, it was keeping them clear that had always been the problem. The watchmen set to work. This was something they understood. They'd done it when they were kids. And, perhaps, they thought, hey, this time we're wearing uniforms. We can't be in the wrong. While Vims was struggling to wedge a bench into the growing wall, he was aware of people behind him. He worked steadily, however, until someone gave a delicate cough. Then he turned. Yes? Can I help you? There was a small group of people, and it was clear to Vims that it was a group pushed together out of shared terror, because, by the look of them, they'd have nothing to do with one another if they could possibly avoid it. The spokesman, or at least the one in front, looked almost exactly like the kind of person Vims had pictured when thinking about the hedge argument murder. ERM, of, Sir. Yes, sir said Vims cheerfully. What, E.R., are you doing, exactly? Keeping the peace, sir. This peace, to be exact. You said that there's, E.R., rioting and soldiers on the way. Very likely, sir. You don't have to ask him, Rutherford, it's his duty to protect us, snapped the woman who was standing, with an air of proprietorship beside the man. Vim's 266 T air YP Ratchet changed his mind about the man. Yes, he had that furtive look of a timid domestic poisoner about him, the kind of man who'd be appalled at the idea of divorce but would plot woman slaughter every day. And you could see why. He gave the lady a nice, warm smile. She was holding a blue vase. How can I help you, ma'am? he said. What are you intending to do about us being murdered in our beds, she demanded. Well, it's not four o'clock yet, ma'am, but if you'll let me know when you want to retire Vims was impressed at the way the woman drew herself up. Even Sybil, in full duchess mode, with the blood of twenty generations of arrogant ancestors behind her, could not have matched her. Rutherford, are you going to do something about this man, she said. Rutherford looked up at Vims. Vims was aware that he was villainously unshaven, disheveled, dirty, and probably starting to smell. He decided not to load more troubles on the man's back. Would you and your lady care to share our barricade, he said. Oh, yes, thank you very Rutherford began, but was outgunned again. Some of that furniture looks very dirty, said M.R.S. Rutherford. And aren't those beer barrels? Yes, ma'am, but they're empty ones, said Vims. Are you sure? I refuse to cower behind alcohol. I have never approved of alcohol, and neither has Rutherford. I can promise you, ma'am that any beer barrel in the presence of my men for any length of time will night watch 267 be empty, said Vims. You may rest assured on that score. And are your men sober and clean living, the woman demanded. Whenever no alternative presents itself, ma'am, said Vims. This seemed acceptable. MRS. Rutherford was like rust in that respect. She listened to the tone of voice, not the words. I think perhaps it would be a good idea, dear, 
if we made haste to Rutherford began. Not without father, said his wife. No problem, ma'am, said Vims. Where is he? On our barricade, of course. Which was, let me tell you, a rather better barricade altogether. Jolly good, ma'am, said Vims. If he'd like to come over here, we'll ERM, you don't quite understand, sir, murmured Rutherford. He is, ERM, on the barricade. Vims looked at the other barricade, and then looked harder. It was just possible to see, near the top of the piled-up furniture, an overstuffed armchair. Further examination suggested that it was occupied by a sleeping, gur in carpet slippers. He's very attached to his armchair, sighed Rutherford. It's going to be an heirloom, said his wife. Be so kind as to send your young men to collect our furniture, will you? And be careful with it. Put it at the back somewhere, where it won't get shot at. Vims nodded at Sam and a couple of the other men as MRS. Rutherford picked her way over the debris and headed for the watch house. Is there going to be any, ting, said MR. Rutherford anxiously. 268 TRYP Ratchet possibly, sir. I'm not very good at that sort of thing, I'm afraid. Don't worry about that, sir. Vims propelled the man over the barricade and turned to the rest of the little group. He'd been aware of eyes boring into him, and now he traced the rays back to their source, a young man in black trousers, a frilly shirt, and long curly hair. This is a ruse, isn't it, said the man. You'll get us in your power and we'll never be seen again, eh? Stay out then, Reg, said Vims. He cupped his hands and turned back to the Whalebone Lane barricade. Anyone else wants to join us had better get a move on, he shouted. You don't know that's my name, said Reg Shu. Vims stared into the big, protruding eyes. The only difference between Reg now and the Reg he'd left back in the future was that Corporal Shu was rather grayer and was held together in places by stitches. Zombiehood would come naturally to Reg. He was born to be dead. He believed so strongly in things that some kind of inner spring kept him going. He'd make a good copper. He didn't make a very good revolutionary. People as meticulously fervent as Reg got real revolutionaries worried. It was the way he stared. You're Reg Shu, he said. You live here, in Whalebone Lane. Aha, you've got secret, lay on me, eh, said Reg with terrifying happiness. Not really, no. Now if you'd be so good I bet you've got a big, le on me a mile long, said Reg. Not a whole mile, Reg, no, said Vims. Listen, Reg, we I demand to see it. Night Watch 269 Vims sighed. Mr. Shu, we don't have a, le on you. We don't have a, le on anyone, understand? Half of us can't read without using a, enger. Reg, we are not interested in you. Reg Shu's slightly worrying eyes remained, XED on Vimsa's face for a moment, and then his brain rejected the information as contrary to whatever total fantasy was going on inside. Well, it's no good you torturing me because I won't reveal any details about my comrades in the other revolutionary cells, said Reg. Okay. I won't, then. Now perhaps that's how we work, see? None of the Cotters knows about the other ones. Really? Do they know about you, said Vims. For a moment, Reek's face clouded. Pardon. Well, you said you don't know about them, said Vims. So? Do they know about you? He wanted to add. You're a cell of one, Reg. The real revolutionaries are silent men with poker player eyes and probably don't know or care if you exist. 
You've got the shirt and the haircut and the sash and you know all the songs, but you're no urban gorilla. You're an urban dreamer. You turn over rubbish bins and scrawl on walls in the name of the people, who'd clip you round the ear if they found you doing it. But you believe. Ah, so you're a secret operative, he said, to get the poor man off the hook. Reg brightened. That's right, he said. The people are the sea in which the revolutionary swims. Like sword, she's. Vim's tried. Pardon, said Reg, without a hint of recognition. And you're a, ounder, thought Vim's. Ned's a revolutionary. He knows how to, ght and he can think, 270t air yp ratchet even if it is on the skew. But, Reg, you really ought to be indoors. Well, I can see you're a dangerous individual, he said. We'd better put you where we can keep an eye on you. Hey, that's right. You can undermine the enemy from within. The relieved Reg raised a, st in salute and clambered over the new barricade with revolutionary speed. There was some hurried conversation behind the old makeshift barricade, already being denuded of MRS. Rutherford's furniture. This was interrupted by the clatter of hoofbeats from Treacle Mine Road and a sudden burst of instant decisiveness on the part of the remainder of the crowd. They poured toward the new of, Chale Barricade with Lance Constable Vims bringing up the rear, fairly well hampered by a dining room chair. Mind out for that, shouted a female voice from somewhere behind him. It's one of a set. Vims put his hand on the young man's shoulder. Just give me your crossbow, will you, he said. The horseman came closer. Sam Vims was not good at horses and something in him resented being addressed by anyone eight feet above the ground. He didn't like the sensation of being looked at by nostrils. He didn't like being talked down to. By the time they reached the barricade, he'd clambered around to the front of it and was standing in the middle of the street. They slowed down. It was probably the way he was moving but held the crossbow in the nonchalant way of someone who knows how to use it but has decided not to for the moment. You, there, said a trooper. Night Watch 271 Yes, said Vims. Are you in charge? Yes. Can I help you? Where are your men? Vims jerked a thumb toward the growing barricade. On the top of the heap, MRS. Rutherford's father was snoring peacefully. But that's a barricade said the trooper. Well done. There's a man waving a, a g. Vims turned. Surprisingly, it was Reg. Some of the men had brought out the old, a g from Tilden's of, c e and stuck it on the barricade, and Reg was the sort to wave any, a g going. Probably high spirits, sir, said Vims. Don't worry. We're all, any. It's a damn barricade, man. A rebel barricade, said the second trooper. Oh boy, thought Vims. They have shiny, shiny breastplates. And wonderfully fresh, pink faces. Not exactly. In fact, it's are you stupid, fellow? Don't you know that all barricades are to be torn down by order of the patrician? The third horseman, who had been staring at Vims, urged his horse a little closer. What's that pip on your shoulder, of, sir, he said. Means I'm sergeant at arms. Special rank. And who are you? He doesn't have to tell you that, said the, RST trooper. Really, said Vims. The man was getting on his nerves. Well. You're just a trooper and I'm a bleeding sergeant, and if you dare speak to me like that again, I'll have you down off that horse and thump you across the ear, understand? 272 T air YP ratchet even the horse took a step backward. The trooper opened his mouth to speak, 
but the third horseman raised a white-gloved hand. Oh dear, thought Vims, focusing on the sleeve of the red jacket. The man was a captain. Not only that, he was an intelligent one, by the look of him. He hadn't mouthed off until he'd had a chance to assess the situation. You got them sometimes. They could be dangerously bright. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.